Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Waiting for the impossible. That's what we're gonna talk about today. And thanks to YouTube, uh, I get to watch games that I miss, 10 minute highlight reels of the games and whatnot. And we're gonna have to do that today. We're gonna have to do a highlight reel of Abraham and Sarah's life and promise of waiting for Isaac to be born, waiting for the impossible and having faith to do that. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 15. We'll be there first. And some of these will be on the screen, some won't. Uh, there was quite a bit of scripture that we need to cover today. Genesis 15, faith to wait for the impossible. We learned last week that God promised Abram that he would become a great nation and have many descendants. Now from the time that God promised Abraham this to the time Isaac is born, it's 25 years. Can you imagine waiting 25 years for a promise to come into fruition? And I can imagine that every year that, you know, his wife, Sarah, now by the way, just so you know, Abram was 75 years old when God gave him this promise. So it's kind of already impossible at that point too. And so uh, Sarai would have been uh, 65. And so you're not really thinking of having children at that age, are you? 25 years later. Now every year, you're probably, if you're Abram, or at the time, Abraham, you're probably wondering, hey God, uh, time's a ticking. How about that promise right about now? So you can imagine that this was a, a journey of faith to really lean in and trust God. And so I pray today that you be encouraged because maybe you've been waiting for God to do something and you just need that, that faith again to remember God is faithful, amen? Let's go to Genesis 15, one through six, because Abram, he, he asked a fair question here. <laughs> I think it's a fair question. Verse one, sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you and your reward will be great. But Abram replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son, since you've given me no children? Eleazar of Damascus, a servant in my household, will inherit all my wealth. You have given me no descendants of my own, so one of my servants will be my heir. Then the Lord said to him, No, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own, and he will be your, your heir. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. That's a fair question, right? God, you promised that through my life and my wife, we would have a great nation and many descendants. So um, I need to have a son in order for that to happen. And so Abram thinks that maybe it's going to be his servant that would receive the blessing, and God corrects him and says, no, that's not how it's going to work. And he says, look up into the sky, count all the stars if you can, that is how many descendants you will have. Now an interesting point is in Genesis chapter 13, God says count the dust. Now he's counting the stars. By the way, have any of you tried counting dust? <laughs> nah. It's an exaggeration on, on purpose because of how many descendants Abram will have. Well, actually scholars believe that when God said count the dust, he was referring to the Jewish descent of people only. Count the stars are all the descendants that would come by faith in Jesus Christ in the New Testament. So what he's saying is it's not just the Jews that will be saved and become you know, many and your nation will be great in the Jewish nation, but the Gentiles, all of us today, when we believe in Jesus Christ, we're like the stars in the universe and Paul calls us that, doesn't he? We're like stars in the universe that we should shine pretty interesting note. And then also the last verse, 
Abram believed the Lord and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. This is a really important scripture in the New Testament that it's by faith Abraham was saved. By faith God saw him as righteous, not by works, not by circumcision. This happened before Abram was circumcised. So this is pointing to the New Testament that all who believe in Jesus Christ will also be called righteous, amen? An important, uh, important piece of information for us. Let's go over to Genesis 16 because we're gonna move through this highlight reel like we would in watching a game on YouTube. And, and just so you know, when you watch highlight reels of games, you miss the penalties, you miss driving down the field to get to the progress of the end zone. So you miss some good stuff. I wanna encourage you to read through this today because we're covering Genesis 15 through 21 and you're gonna miss some really good lessons, okay? Because we don't have, we're not going through this entire, each chapter, and each verse, but you'll miss a lot of good lessons and filling in the blanks. So I wanna encourage you to do that today or this week. Read through Genesis 15 through 21. All right, Genesis 16, one through six. Now this, this paragraph is why we have marriage retreats. Uh, here we go. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him, but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, the Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. Now you get it? Um, I always get bothered that Abram never declines that. <laughs> We're adults here, I can say that, right? And Abram agreed with Sarai's proposal. That's a problem. So Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abram as a wife. This happened 10 years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. So Abram had sexual relations with Hagar and she became pregnant. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress, Sarai, with contempt. Uh, and again, another reason why we have marriage retreats. Then Sarai said to Abram, this is all your fault. <laughs> Wait a second, that was your idea. <laughs> I put my servant into your arms, but now that she's pregnant, she treats me with contempt. The Lord will show who's wrong, you or me. Wow. So, um, obviously, I actually look at Abram as responsible as well. As the man of the house or the leader of the home, he should have not acquiesced to his wife's request. What do we see here? We see that Abram and Sarai take matters into their own hands while they wait. That the waiting season is starting to take a toll. And they're struggling with that. And there are consequences to playing God, isn't there? If you're not aware, uh, Ishmael ends up being where the line of many people who are now Muslims come from. Not all, but scholars definitely have traced uh, Islam to uh, the people or descendants of Ishmael. So Abram now has this issue where in the future, his own people, his own line would have this struggle with another nation. And Ishmael ends up being blessed by God because Abram actually asked God to bless him, thinking it's gonna be Ishmael that gets the blessing, and it's not. So when we take matters into our own hands and we try to play God, we actually mess things up in our story, don't we? Let's keep going. Because God is really faithful at reassuring. And, and just so you know, this was wrong, what they did. Okay, God never condones these kind of relationships. God never condones in scripture having multiple wives. He never does, okay? He's never happy with it. But in their failures, God still works his plan, doesn't he? And that's what you'll notice as you read through this story. So chapter 17, verse one. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Now they believe that, that God said this because before that, Abram was trying to work out God's plan instead of trusting God Almighty who knows how to do what he does. So he's saying, trust me, I'm God Almighty, I can do anything, in other words. 
I have the power to do this. I have the power to bring a son in your latter years. That's what he's trying to say here. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. He's having to remind him because he messed up. At this, Abram fell face down on the ground. Then God said to him, this is my covenant with you. I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. What's more, I am changing your name. It will no longer be Abram. Instead, you'll be called Abraham, for you'll be the father of many nations. And that's what his name means. I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will become many nations, and the kings will be among them. I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you from generation to generation. This is the everlasting covenant. I will always be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And I will give you the entire land of Canaan where you now live as a foreigner to you and your descendants. It will be their possession forever and I will be their God. Wow, God's getting specific now. He's not talking in generalities. He's preparing Abram to receive this blessing by changing his name to Abraham. Now this is a year before Sarah gives birth to Isaac. So he really is preparing Abram to get ready to receive these promises. And so we go into Genesis 17, 15 through 22, and that's the part where Sarai's name is changed to Sarah. And in this moment, uh, Abraham struggles with some disbelief because you know, he's, he's gonna be 100 years old and Sarah's 90 years old. And then Abraham assumes that it was Ishmael, but it wasn't. And, and God gives them their son's name, Isaac, in this portion of scripture in Genesis 17, 15 through 22. So now we see that God is even getting specific about their son's name so he can help them see this is about to happen. Trust me. And God will do that. God will drop in as needed times of reassure, reassuring uh, words and just confirmation and scriptures. Have you, anyone ever experienced that? where God says he's gonna do something in your life or you, you sense that God's gonna do something and he, and he encourages you and brings someone along. Now I wanna go to Genesis chapter 18, nine through 15 because I think this is an important part of understanding here. Before our verses, three visitors show up and one of them is the Lord or what we believe in our study of the Old Testament is the pre-incarnate Jesus. So, a theophany, a visitation of Jesus without human body, more of a divine body. And that's, there's arguments on whether that's true. And just so you know, I put an article online on my notes today, uh, calvarydover.org and then forward slash uh, grow articles. Uh, you'll see my, my sermon notes and I put an article on there about the pre-incarnate Jesus. So in other words, Jesus, we believe that Jesus was showing up because uh, it says he was Lord, and there was different images of Jesus. We're going to get into more of those as we go through Hebrews 11. But before Jesus was in human body, he was a divine being, right? He always existed. And so we have angels, and then we have the Lord uh, that show up. And Abram and Sarah are show hospitality, and they start feeding them. And as they're eating, this is what's said in, in chapter 18. Uh, verse nine, where is, your Sarah, or where is Sarah, your wife, the visitors asked. She's inside the tent, Abraham replied. Then one of them said, I will return to you about this time next year and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Sarah was listening to this conversation from the tent. Abraham and Sarah are both very old by this time and Sarah was long past the age of having children. So she laughed silently to herself <laughs> and said, how could a worn out woman like me enjoy such pleasure, especially when my master, my husband, is also so old? It's probably a good question, right? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return about this time next year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she denied it, saying, I didn't laugh. But the Lord said, no, you did laugh. 
It's a, a matter of fact statement there. <laughs> oh boy, is this bring back any kind of resemblance of our journeys at times? So this time next year, about this time, they would have a son. They've already found out his name is Isaac. Sarah's name has changed. Abraham's name has changed. So she's still struggling to really believe this. And do you blame her? She's 90 years old. It's kind of a natural doubt or struggle to believe. She's laughing in disbelief. And laughing in disbelief is to doubt or to think something is so absurd or impossible that it's laughable, right? But she was corrected that day, and I'm sure Abraham heard everything. I'm sure he took this to heart as well, because the Lord said, is anything too hard for the Lord? And let that sink in for a moment. Is anything too hard for God? No. No. So Sarah lies, and then God corrects that lie. (laughs) And what's interesting is God still blesses them. It's interesting. It's beautiful. So guess what happens? Genesis 21, 1 through 7. God delivers on his promise, and Sarah gives birth to Isaac. Sarah was 90, and Abraham was 100. And it happened. And if that's not, you know, hard to believe, or if that's impossible to believe, not only did that promise get fulfilled, and not only was that hard to wait 25 years, but guess how many years they had to wait to see descendants of their son? Don't forget that. Because God promised descendants. So they had one son, It took 40 years, 40 years for Isaac to get married. And then on top of that, because Rebecca couldn't get pregnant, it took another 20 years. So let's do some quick math, 60 years. 60 years they believed that God would deliver on his promise to give give him descendants. And again, that was just seeing kids of their, their son Isaac, so they were grandparents at this time, not even the huge nation of descendants. They would never see that before they died. But they believed it would happen even if they did not see it for themselves because they had faith. They had faith. 60 years longer, they had to wait to see this descendant come, this grandson or granddaughter being born And they did, and Rebecca gave birth to twin boys, Jacob and Esau. So Hebrews 11, we're back in our scripture now. What a journey, huh? And again, that was your YouTube highlight reel of the journey. Hebrews 11, 11 through 12 says this. This is back to our text, our main text that we're studying through. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child. Though she was barren, So it wasn't just because of old age. She was barren and was too old. She believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from this one man who who was as good as dead. A nation with so many people that, like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, there is no way to count them. God did that. I love what's said about Sarah here. In the NIV version, Sarah was commended because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. That is faith, my friends. We're learning what faith is through Hebrews 11. That's faith, that you would consider God faithful, that he could do the impossible. When you're facing something impossible, I want to encourage you to have faith that believes God is faithful. That God will fulfill his promises here on earth. Now, it's interesting that we have to look at this scripture and apply it to ourselves carefully. um, Because today, we don't necessarily apply everything that happened in this story. Let me explain. This is an extraordinary miracle with a significant purpose to fulfill God's redemption of all mankind. 
This was a specific promise given to Abraham for a specific purpose. What am I talking about here? God was gonna build his kingdom and then save mankind through Abraham's descendants. And he did it doing a miracle, the impossible, okay? And he did it through Jesus Christ being born. So what I'm trying to say here is is that um, we don't need to go around asking for people who are 100 years old and 90 years old that they get pregnant. It was in this situation, part of God's redemptive plan to save mankind, that God chose to give Abraham and Sarah a miracle baby at an older age. Today, we don't need that because Jesus is the only Savior we'll ever need to do that. And yeah, amen. Jesus is, Jesus is enough to save mankind. This was a specific plan and purpose. But is God still opening wombs and performing miracles today? Absolutely. Praise the Lord. It doesn't mean we need to walk around and ask, hey, I'm 100 years old, God. Should I have a child now? Not exactly. This was a specific promise for a specific purpose purpose. So sometimes when we read these scriptures and interpret it, we go, well, Lord, have you promised me the same thing? Well, that was for that time. God has promises for different things and for different situations that you're going through. So I want to make sure we understand that. And I want you to understand too, that Pastor Ryan believes in miracles for the impossible. Okay, so don't take me wrong. Don't take me wrong. Amen. Amen. The journey of faith isn't perfect, is it? Let's, let's try to apply this now to us in everyday situations. While Abraham and Sarah had their doubts and downfalls, they kept believing and obeying, didn't they? I mean, it was a little sloppy, but they returned to the Lord and they believed and obeyed again. And I'm thankful that God records and included these imperfect moments. Aren't you thankful? It shows us how God is gracious and bears with our weaknesses and our weak faith that needs to mature. It shows that God still wants to work in the midst of our doubts, questioning, and shortcomings. And what we can see in Scripture is that Abraham and Sarah did return to the Lord when they messed up. They did always come back to him. They did begin to believe and trust him again and they allowed God to work. But God was gonna fulfill this plan through them and he had the grace to show them. This story doesn't give me an excuse though to waver in my faith, does it? Rather, it teaches me that God is faithful and to keep my faith in him for the impossible. So when I see stories like this and I see imperfect people, I don't go, okay, God, I guess I can mess up like 10 times and you still love me and take care of me. No, grace is not permission to mess up or sin. Grace is permission to change. Grace is permission and help to grow. Grace is given and those who humble themselves and go, I do need to change, I do need to trust God, I do need to believe, I need to change my ways, they will take that grace and apply it and they'll live differently. And so that's, that's the reason why God showed them grace, so that they would grow through their doubts and disbelief and trust God. And it's a journey, isn't it? It is, it's an imperfect journey. How should we view and handle the impossible in this story? Let's look at that for a moment. How should we view and handle the impossible? Well, I believe we need to live by faith and not by sight. We can't think logically all the time. The impossible is often illogical to our human thinking. Abraham thought logically and suggested it would be Ishmael, his son, with Hagar, but that wasn't God's plan. See, that's thinking logically. I already have a son, just bless him. No, it wasn't gonna be the logical way. Secondly, how should we view and handle the impossible? Don't dwell on the how, dwell on who God is and what he can do. 
Don't dwell on the how. Dwell on God and what he can do. I think it's natural to question how, isn't it? When it's such an impossible situation or so big you don't get how God's gonna make it happen. And I think this is where much of our questioning comes from. We try to figure out how God will do the miracle. When it doesn't make logical sense to us, we begin to doubt. We can begin to doubt that he can do it, do it or even do it all together. And now you add on the time of waiting for this miracle to happen, and now you really start to go through questioning things, right? What I'm doing is I'm giving you an example of my own life. There have been seasons in my life where I'm praying and I'm saying, dear Lord, I ask, and I stop right there. Because I start to overthink or think logically about how God's gonna do it instead of thinking about who God is and what he's already done. And if I don't believe that God can do the impossible, then I won't ask for the impossible. Think about that. If I believe God can do the impossible, I'm more likely to ask God for the impossible. So God has, over the years, tested my faith and tried my faith in him and trust. And I just wanna encourage you that you cannot focus on the how. God does not work the way we work. Let me tell you a quick story. Uh, we started seeing a lot of leaking in our ceiling, our roof here in the sanctuary. And it came down to a roof inspection. And it was basically that we're gonna need to spend uh, over $200,000 to replace our roof here. This is during 2020. And uh, that was scary because that's a lot of money. And we didn't know what was gonna happen to our church in 2020 because we weren't here for three months and you know, you, you, you don't know if we're gonna be able to have the provision for the church moving forward and it was, it was scary. And God tested my faith in that moment and we had a prayer meeting as a staff and we prayed that God would provide. Um, and God works in mysterious ways. Because we had a tornado hit our church. <laughs> and you know, God provides in some weird ways. Now I want you to understand something too though, God preserved human life too. Because that day, now I'm the kind of guy like, if there's some rain, suck it up buttercup, let's get into work, okay? I'm a little old school. My dad raised me and my mom raised me to work hard. But because of 2020, we had you know, the whole Zoom meetings and online you know, meetings. And I was like, all right, pretty high winds, a lot of rain with this hurricane coming through. Let's just go ahead and do online meetings on this Tuesday. And, I, and let me tell you, I actually went to my eye doctor appointment down the road here thinking, you know, hey, I'm gonna do my thing, then I'll go back home, get on the meeting. So we shut down the office. Little did I know, my brother who runs the school, he actually closed the summer break program so that there would be any kids in the building. And I didn't know this. I get a call from Dorothy after I heard a train go over the eye appointment that I was in. I was in, in my eye doctors and I heard, I mean, the electricity went out. Everyone got alerts on their phone and I hear a train. And I'm like, there's no train on, on State Street. It was the tornado. It went right over my doctor's office. And Dorothy calls me and goes, hey, just to let you know, the tornado hit the church. And I said, Dorothy, are all the kids there? And she's like, no, your brother, your brother closed it. He, my brother felt compelled we need to close it. I felt compelled we need to close it. God was preserving human life. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now here's, yeah. Well, long story short, uh, insurance guy comes out and says, yeah, you need a new roof. <laughs> I was like, all right, praise the Lord. Didn't see that coming, but God is good. 
and all, and all the time. God is good. How should we handle, that's just one story of many I'm sure you could share as well, but how should we handle the waiting season? Abraham and Sarah, they struggled in the waiting season, and waiting is very difficult, isn't it? Let me, let me encourage you with this. God tests our faith in the waiting season. And God uses the waiting season to draw us closer to him, just so you know. Because as we have to wait, hopefully our posture is lean in more. Not, ah, God, God, you're not there. You're not gonna do it, are you? Just lean in more. Get closer to God. When you have to wait, guess what you start doing? You start getting down on your knees. I'm not gonna do it right now because I need to get back up, but... When you gotta wait for a long time and trust God for a miracle or something impossible, it drives you to your knees. And that's where God wants to meet with you too. Because we're just running around life going way too fast, not slowing down and getting with God. God uses the waiting season to develop and deepen our faith. In other words, to deepen our trust in him. And he will show you little confirmations along the way that God's gonna do it. That he's still there, which matters more than anything else, right? that God is still there. And then God uses the waiting, this is so important. God uses the waiting season to develop us into the person that can properly receive and steward the blessing. If you're not ready to receive that promise with your character, your integrity, if you're not gonna be a good steward, God's not gonna give it to you yet. Abraham and Sarah had to grow they had to learn, you can trust me. You can trust me. God's teaching them, trust me. Okay, I'm gonna do this. Trust me. You messed up? Okay, I'm gonna do this. Trust me. And the more they did, the more they were ready to receive the promises, the ones that they would receive before they died. And lastly, church, nothing is too hard for God. Nothing is too hard for God. Can we prepare our hearts to pray for this today? We're gonna worship together. We're gonna sing the same God. I'm gonna ask you to come down here and believe and pray and ask God for the impossible. And here's an important point. You know, if we believe that God can do the impossible, then we'll even believe for the possible bracket, you know? All the things that are possible, we'll believe that and we'll pray for those too. If you can pray for the impossible and, and trust God, then you can believe for the possible bracket, right? The daily needs that we have. The daily needs that we have that God will provide. You know, just so you know, two times a year, we celebrate the impossible. Christmas and Easter. The virgin birth. Impossible. Do you know you celebrate that though as Christians? The birth of God in the human form, Jesus Christ, the incarnate Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, through the Virgin Mary, you celebrate that every Christmas, I think, right? You know, that's a miracle of the impossible, right? You know that miracle took place because the miracle of Abraham and Sarah having a son at age 190, okay, that, that miracle is the reason why we have Jesus. So we believe that, so why can't we believe the impossible today for other things? Then we go to Easter and people raised from the dead like Jesus, crucified three days later. And by the way, he, he raises Children from dead. He raises Lazarus from the dead. He does the impossible. God raises him from the dead. And we celebrate the impossible being accomplished so that we can have everlasting life. So that we can have a resurrected body. Amen. Now listen, I'm giving you theology, not hype. Right? This is biblical truth that he is the God of the impossible. He's the same God. 
Lord, let faith rise up in us right now. That when we ask for the impossible, we will believe it can be done. What about Sarah? God doesn't want to use me. There's no way God would bless me with this gift at 90 years old. That's a lie from the devil. God wants to use you. God is preparing you. Hey, for all of us in our latter years, God's not done working with you. God is not done with his purpose in your life. You can minister to someone who needs Jesus Christ. He's not done with your purpose in life. Is it possible for God to heal someone of a severe illness or condition? Yes, it is possible. With God, all things are possible. Is the salvation of a friend or family member who you view as beyond saving impossible for God? I think I, I, think I answered my first question wrong, didn't I? Nothing is impossible for God. Anyone can be saved. Any family member can be saved. Any friend can be saved. All things are possible for him today. Is it, is it impossible for God to reconcile a broken relationship with a family member, yeah. a spouse, a friend? All things are possible for God. Is it impossible for God to break an addiction or a bad habit in your life? No, of course not. With God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. Do you believe this today? Now here's a key thing. You can't force the other person to change. That's the hard part. There are some things out of our control that we'll have to wait and pray and surrender them to God. You know what I'm talking about, right? Relationships, salvations. You can't, you can't drag someone to Jesus. You can't drag a friend or a spouse to change. Man, we have a hard time changing ourselves. How do you think we're gonna change other people? But God can. God can. We serve the God of the impossible. Don't give up hope. Don't give up hope today. Can we just right now just begin to pray? Because I line up with you sometimes. I line up right behind you sometimes or in front of you and go, Lord, that seems impossible. And I think where I get in trouble is I try to figure out how. I don't need to do that. I just need to pray and ask God. I'm gonna ask you that if you need prayer today for someone or something in your life or someone in your life, would you just come down here? Do not be afraid to come down here. We wanna pray with you. We wanna anoint you with oil. And we're gonna sing the same God and we're gonna declare these words today. Stand in the gap for someone at least. And we're gonna have team members and prayer team members and pastors come behind you. And if you wanna tell them what you're, you need prayer for, you tell them. You let them know. God, increase our faith right now in this moment. I thank you, God, that you're healing bodies in Jesus' name. I thank you, God, that you're restoring marriages in Jesus' name. It's gonna take time. That you're drawing the prodigals home. We know it's gonna take time. God, we wait the right way. Give us the faith to wait. Give us the patience to wait in Jesus' name. God, increase our faith and trust in you, Lord. We declare, God, that all things are possible for you. It's your word. We're not making this up. You've said it yourself. Lord, give us the faith and give us the patience to wait. Thank you, Lord. Church, why don't we stand together and worship and declare this. And if you're in your seat and you need to lift someone up, you need to pray for a certain situation.